Louis Antoine Eliacut Owen de Saint Just was a military and political leader during the French Revolution, the youngest of the deputies elected to the National Convention in 1792. Saint Just rose quickly in their ranks and became a major leader of the government of the French First Republic. He spearheaded the movement to execute King Louis XVI and later drafted the radical French constitution of 1793. He became a close friend of Maximilien Robespierre and served with him as one of the commissioners of the powerful Committee of Public Safety, dispatched as a commissar to the army during its rocky start in the French Revolutionary Wars. Saint Just imposed severe discipline, and he was credited by many for the army's subsequent revival at the front. Back in Paris, he supervised the consolidation of Robespierre's power through a ruthless and bloody program of intimidation. In his relatively brief time on the historical stage, he became the enduring public face of the Reign of Terror and was dubbed the Angel of Death by later writers. Saint Just organized the arrests and prosecutions of many of the most famous figures of the Revolution. Saint Just was arrested in the violent episode of Ninth Thermidor and executed the next day with Robespierre and their allies. In many histories of the Revolution, the deaths at the guillotine mark the end of the reign of terror. Early life Louis Antoine de Saint Just was born at Decize in the former Nivernais province of central France. He was the eldest child of Louis Jean de Saint Just de Richebourg, a retired French cavalry officer, Knight of the Order of Saint Louis, and of the twenty years younger Marie Anne Robinot, the daughter of a notary. He had two younger sisters, born in 1768 and 1769. The family later moved north and in 1776 settled in the village of Blerincourt in the former Picardy province establishing themselves as a countryside noble family living out of the rents from their land. A year after the move, Louis Antoine's father died leaving his mother with the three children. She saved diligently for her only son's education, and in 1779 he was sent to the Oratorian School at Soissons. After a promising start, Saint Just acquired a reputation as a troublemaker, augmented by infamous stories of how he led a student's rebellion and tried to burn down the school. Nonetheless, he earned his graduation in 1786. His rest of nature, however, did not diminish. As a young man, Saint Just was wild, handsome, and transgressive. Well-connected and popular, he showed a special affection toward a young woman of Blerincourt, Therese Gellet. She was the daughter of another wealthy notary, a powerful and autocratic figure in the town. He was still an undistinguished adolescent. He is said to have proposed marriage to her. She is said to have desired it. Though no hard evidence exists regarding their relationship, official records show that on 25 July 1786, Therese was married to Emmanuel Thorin, the scion of a prominent local family. Saint Just was out of town and unaware of the event, and tradition portrays him as broken-hearted. Whatever his true state, it is known that a few weeks after the marriage he abruptly left home for Paris, without an announcement but not without gathering up a pair of pistols and a good quantity of his mother's silver. His venture turned short when his mother had him seized by police and sent to a reformatory where he stayed from September 1786 to March 1787. Chastened, Saint just attempted to begin anew. He enrolled as a student at the School of Law, Reims University. After a year, however, he drifted away from law school and returned to his mother's home in Blerincourt Penelis, without any occupational prospects. Organed at a young age Saint Just had shown a fascination with literature, and during his stay at the reformatory, he used his time to begin writing a lengthy poem. He published it anonymously more than two years later, in May 1789, at the very outbreak of the revolution. The 21-year-old Saint Just thereby added his own touch to the social tumult of the times with Organt, poem in twenty cantos. The poem, a medieval epic fantasy, relates the quest of young Antoine Organt. It extols the virtues of primitive man. 
praising his libertinism and independence while blaming all present-day troubles on modern inequalities of wealth and power. Written in a style mimicking Ariosto, it gave a juvenile foreshadowing of his own political extremism, spiked with brutal satire and scandalous pornographic episodes. It also made unmistakable attacks upon the monarchy, the nobility, and the church. Contemporaries regarded Organ as something of a salacious novelty and it was quickly banned, but censors who tried to confiscate it discovered that few copies were available anywhere. It did not sell well and resulted in a financial loss for its author. The public's taste for literature had changed in the prelude to the revolution, and St. Just's taste changed with it. Aside from a few pages of an unfinished novel found amidst his papers at the end of his life, Saint just devoted his future writing entirely to undecorated essays of social and political theory. With his previous ambitions of literary and loyally fame unfulfilled, Saint just directed his focus on the single goal of revolutionary command. Early revolutionary career Blair Ancourt's traditional power structure was reshaped by the events of 1789. The notary Gallet, previously an undisputed town leader, was challenged by a group of reformists who were led by several of St. Just's friends, including the husband of his sister Louise. Their attempts were not successful until 1790 when Blair and Court held its first open municipal elections. Mandated by the National Constituent Assembly, the new electoral structure allowed St. Just's friends to assume authority in the village as mayor, secretary, and, in the case of his brother-in-law, head of the local National Guard. The jobless St. Just, despite not meeting the legal age and tax qualifications, was allowed to join the Guard. St. Just immediately exhibited the ruthless disciplinarianism for which he would be famous. Within a few months he was the commanding officer, at the rank of lieutenant colonel. At local meetings he moved attendees with his patriotic zeal and flair. In one much repeated story, Saint Just brought the town council to tears by thrusting his hand into the flame of a burning anti-revolutionary pamphlet, swearing his devotion to the Republic. He had powerful allies when he sought to become a member of his district's electoral assembly, and he initiated correspondence with well-known leaders of the revolution like Camille Desmoulins. In late 1790, he wrote to Robespierre for the first time, asking him to consider a local petition. The letter was filled with the highest of praise, beginning, You, who uphold our tottering country against the torrent of despotism and intrigue, you whom I know, as I know God, only through his miracles, through their correspondence, the two developed a deep and mysterious friendship that would last until the day they died. L'Esprit de la Revolution while Saint Just waited for the next election. He composed an extensive work, L'Esprit de la Revolution et de la Constitution de France, published in the spring of 1791. His writing style had shed all satire and now adopted the stern and moralizing tone of classical Romans so adored by French revolutionaries. It revealed an unexpectedly moderate set of principles deeply influenced by Montesquieu, and remained fully confined to a paradigm of constitutional monarchy. He expressed abhorrence at the violence in the revolution thus far, and he disdained the character of those who partook in it as little more than riotous slaves. Instead, he heaped his praise upon the people's representatives in the legislative assembly, whose sober virtue would guide the revolution best, spread out over five books. L'Esprit de la Revolution is inconsistent in many of its assertions but still shows clearly that Saint Just no longer saw government his oppressive to man's nature, but necessary to its success. Its ultimate object was to edge society in the direction of the distant ideal. The new work, like its predecessor, attracted minimal readership. On 21 June 1791, just days after it was published, all attention became focused on King Louis XVI's ill-fated flight to Varennes and St. Just's theories about constitutional monarchy were made suddenly irrelevant. 
Yet the episode had another effect, it fostered a public anger toward the king which simmered all year until finally a Parisian mob attacked the Tuileries Palace on 10 August 1792. The timing was excellent for Saint Just, who turned the legal age of 25 before the end of the month. The fear inspired by the invasion of the Tuileries made most of his opponents retire from the scene, and Saint Just was elected as one of the deputies for the département of Aisne. He left for Paris to join the National Convention as its youngest member. Deputy to the Convention among the deputies, Saint Just was watchful but interacted little at first. He joined the Parisian Jacobin Club but he remained aloof from Girondins and Montagnards alike. He waited until 13 November 1792 to give his first speech to the convention, but when he did the effect was spectacular. What brought him to the lectern was the discussion over how to treat the king after Varennes. In dramatic contrast to the earlier speakers, Saint just delivered a blazing condemnation of the king. He demanded that Louis Capet should be judged not as a king or even a citizen, but as a traitor, an enemy who deserves death. As for me, he declared, I see no middle ground. This man must reign or die. He oppressed a free nation. He declared himself its enemy. He abused the laws. He must die to assure the repose of the people. Since it was in his mind to crush the people to assure his own, the young deputy's speech electrified the convention. Saint Just was interrupted frequently by bursts of applause and towards the end of his speech he uttered his eerily universal observation. No one can reign innocently, Robespierre was particularly impressed. He spoke from the lectern the next day in terms almost identical to those of Saint Just and the views became the official position of the Jacobins. By December, that position had become law. The king was taken to a trial before the convention, sentenced to death, and executed by guillotine on 21 January 1793. Constitution of 1793. Because the first French constitution had included a role for the king, it was long since invalid and needed to be updated for the Republic. A large number of drafts had been circulating within the convention since the king's execution, and Saint Just submitted his own lengthy proposal on 24 April 1793. His draft incorporated the most common assertions of the others. The right to vote, the right to petition, and equal eligibility for employment were among the basic principles that made his draft tenable. Where he stood apart from the rest was on the issue of elections. Saint just dismissed all complex systems of voting and eligibility and supported only the classical style of a simple majority of citizens in a nationwide vote. Amid a flurry of proposals by other deputies, Saint just held inflexibly to his one man, one vote plan, and this conspicuous homage to Greco Roman traditions enhanced his political cachet. When no plan gained enough votes to pass, a compromise was made which tasked a small body of deputies as official constitutional draftsmen, and Saint just was among the five elected members. In recognition of the importance of their mission, the draftsmen were all added to the powerful new Committee of Public Safety. The convention had given the committee extraordinary authority to provide for state security ever since the outbreak of the French Revolutionary War. In early 1793, Saint just took charge of the issue and led the development of the French Constitution of 1793. Before the end of his first term, the new document was completed, submitted to the convention, and ratified as law on 24 June 1793. The new constitution remained a showpiece for Saint just but little more. However much he may have wanted to see it implemented, emergency measures for wartime were in effect. The war had called for a moratorium on constitutional democracy. It gave supreme power to the sitting convention, with the Committee of Public Safety at the top of its administrative pyramid, Robes Pierre, with Saint Just's assistance fought vigorously to ensure that the government would remain under emergency measures, revolutionary, until victory. Committee of Public Safety 
prescription of the Girondins during the time that Saint Just was working on the Constitution, dramatic political warfare was taking place. The sans culottes deemed the people by many radicals and represented by the Paris Commune, had grown antipathetic to the moderate Durandans and on 2 June 1793, in a mass action supported by National Guardsmen, they surrounded the convention and exacted the arrest of the Girondine deputies, the deputies, even the Montagnards who had long enjoyed an informal alliance with the sans culottes resented the intimidation but they were compelled to make some obeisance. The Girondine leader Jacques-Pierre Brissot was indicted for treason and scheduled for trial, but the other Brissotans were imprisoned without formal charges. The convention debated their fate and the political disorder lasted for weeks. Saint Just had previously remained silent about the Girondins but now clearly stood with Robespierre who had been thoroughly opposed to most of them for a long time. When the initial indictment by the committee was served, it was Saint Just who delivered the report to the convention. In its secret negotiations, the Committee of Public Safety was initially unable to form a consensus concerning the jail deputies. But as some Girondins fled to the provinces and attempted to incite an insurrection, its opinion hardened. By early July, St. Just was able to address the convention with a lengthy report in the name of the committee, and his damning attack left no room for any further conciliation. The Girondins' trials must proceed, he said, and any verdicts must be severe. The proceedings dragged on for months, but Brissot and 20 of his allies were eventually condemned and sent to the guillotine on 31 October 1793. Saint just used their situation to gain approval for intimidating new laws, culminating in the law of suspects which gave the committee vast new powers of arrest and punishment. Military Commissar Saint just made the proposal that deputies from the convention should directly oversee all military efforts, which was approved on 10 October 1793, amid worsening conditions at the front in the fall of that year. Several deputies were sent to the critical area of Alsace to shore up the disintegrating army of the Rhine. Results were not sufficiently forthcoming, so at the end of the month Saint Just himself was sent there along with an ally from the convention, Philippe François Joseph Labar. The two men were charged with extraordinary powers to impose discipline and reorganize the troops. From the start, Saint Just dominated the mission. He was relentless in demanding results from the commanders as well as sympathetic to the complaints of common soldiers. On his first day at the front, he issued a proclamation promising examples of justice and severity as the army has not yet witnessed within a short time. Many officers were dismissed and many more were executed by firing squad, including at least one general. The entire army was placed immediately under the harshest discipline, among soldiers and civilians alike. Saint just repressed opponents of the revolution but he did not agree to the mass executions ordered by some of the other deputies on the mission. He vetoed much of the deputies' work and had many of them recalled to Paris. Local politicians were even more vulnerable to him. Even the powerful Eulodius Schneider, the revolutionary leader of Alsace's largest city and called the Marat of Strasbourg, was arrested by St. Just's orders and rapidly dispatched to the guillotine. St. Just worked closely only with General Charles Picagru, a reliable Jacobin whom he respected, under St. Just's unblinking surveillance. Picagru and General Lazarus Hoche ably secured the frontier and began an invasion of the German Rhineland. With the army revitalized, Saint Just returned briefly to Paris where his success was applauded. However, there was little time to celebrate. He was quickly sent back to the front lines, this time in Belgium where the Army of the North was experiencing the same problems of discipline and organization. Again he delivered results ruthlessly and effectively, but after less than a month the mission was cut short. As Paris convulsed in political violence, his assistance was required by Robespierre. 